All right, you rockers, as promised to you, the second of our visitors here inside the asylum for this week. Calling in, that is Rob Carlton, guitarist, well, like no other, so can compare him to Hendrix. And Rob is on the phone with me right now. How's it going, dude? Great to be here, uh, Turbo. Glad to have you, man. We've been been well, talking back and forth by email, and my apologies for taking so long to get back to you to set this up. I've been a little busy. I know you were. You had a bunch of shows that you you recently did. Yep, we're, we're just keeping quite busy with the band, and uh, we've got this new band that's going to break out and do a lot of stuff. Uh, we'll be down in Staten Island on August 23rd, uh, part of the Northeast Music Festival. And so you, everybody in the New York area will get to see a full set from this new band that we uh, that we put together in the last, uh, this year, actually. Very cool, man. Now, for, for those that aren't familiar with, with you and your music over the years, I mean, you are not new to the industry in any way. You've been around, uh, you know, for, for a while, and you've been making music for some time, and... You've even opened for uh, such acts like Cinderella, Zeba, and Blue Oyster Cult. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with you, I just thought maybe you could kind of fill everyone yes. in on how, yeah, uh, how you got started. Yep, I'll just uh, bring up the speed a little bit. Uh, to go way back, um, I was in a band called Empire back, back in the uh, late 80s, not early 90s. Uh, we did our first album at, at uh, the Boogie Hotel, which was owned by Foghat at the time. Uh, and uh, we made quite a noise with that. It got uh, released in Europe, and it got on a lot of uh, best of lists. And uh, uh, the guitar player, Jack Starr, uh, if anyone out there knows him, or Steve Price, they guessed it on the uh, album. It was called Empire of the Foundation. And you can still uh, see it on eBay uh, sometimes. Uh, Catching, uh, costing like something like two hundred bucks and above, so it's kind of a kind of a rare album at this point. Uh, we started, we did our first recordings there. From that, we went on to play the local Long Island, New York circuit. We opened for Cinderella, Blois to Cult, uh, you know, uh, and we uh, you know did a lot of things like that. Uh, and through that, I was able to uh, gain the attention of Joe Bouchard, the bass player of Blois to Cult, and he ended up producing the band and. Um, as far as, uh, you know, if you look under uh, Blue Oyster Cult's history and uh, Joe Bouchard, who was with the band about 20 years or so, um, he listed under his producing credits is the is the band Empire, which is the band I, I was in for about nine years, actually. So uh, from there, I went on to other bands, uh, toured all over the country, did festivals, um, did a lot of things. Uh, then I started releasing solo albums, and you can find out all about that stuff on, just Google me. Rob Carlton or Rob Carlton Band or Rob Carlton Seven Thunders. And uh, you can find out all about my solo albums. Um, you know, my first solo album was mastered by uh, uh, the guys in King's X. Uh, some people out there might know that band, uh, King's X. Uh, they helped me with the first album. And um, I've gotten always gotten great reviews. Uh, very rarely do, have I gotten a bad review on any of my solo records or any of my music, actually, for that matter. So I've been very... Uh, blessed by that, and, you know, it's been kind of neat, and, uh, you know, just been, uh, this last album that I did, Seven Thunders, had uh, a track on it that's been, it's, to this day, it's being played all over the place, uh, on different radio stations, um, I know I've given it to you, John, I believe you, you might have a copy, I believe, do you have, have one? Yeah, yeah, I do have Seven Thunders, uh, we've had it for a while here at my home station of Bull Spike Radio, where we do have you guys have you in rotation uh, with it, and I played it a few times here inside the exactly. asylum. So people are familiar yep. with it. Yep, and uh, anybody can get that on. Uh, you can find it on Spotify and iTunes and uh, uh, you know Pandora and uh, you know it's CD Baby. Of course, it's all over. It's all over. Uh, you can find it on on the internet and. Uh, so there's, there's some commercial stations uh, in the New England area that play it. WTOS uh, is one of them in New England here. And uh, it's available in the record stores in New England as well. And, and uh, 
you know, I've also gotten great reviews from New York as far as the Good Times magazine out in, down in New York there and um, Pennsylvania as well, Pennsylvania musicians. So I'm just kind of very thankful. It's, it's, it's doing pretty well for an independent release that, uh, that I put out as a guitar player. And uh, it continues to this day to keep, uh, to keep pushing with great reviews and radio play. And uh, it's on quite a few lists, uh, including uh, LKCB in Canada. It's on their regular playlist. Well, as it's should, yeah, as it should be, because, I mean, it's just solid, you know, it's, it's pure solid rock musicianship from, I mean, you, like I said, as you said, you've been around for years now, I mean, Empire, and, I mean, you've, I mean, you want to about legendary connections, you've, you've got it, I mean, what were, being that you've been around, you know, as long as you have, you've been lucky enough to kind of see a lot of the musicians, you know, kind of, turn into what they are today and be around some of that as well as be influenced some by some of the, the earlier stuff. What got you going at first back in the day when when Empire got started up? Um, well, you know what? I'll tell you what got me started. As a, as a kid, uh, a very little kid, um, my mom used to rent rooms in this particular place in New York and uh, uh, different guitar players at some time to time would rent rooms and I uh, Give me guitar lessons, actually. I would run into them, and as a little kid, I'd get these guitar lessons uh, from a lot of different musicians, and uh, uh, that really got me uh, interested in it, as well as hearing Jimi Hendrix and Zeppelin and, uh, you know, some of the later. Deep Purple is one of my one of my favorites, and uh, on and on and on. And I just kind of got the, the caught the bug from all that, you know, as a guitar player. Started to get into it deeper. I've gotten been so so lucky and blessed to get uh, tons of endorsements. I have about 10 right now. I've, I've had uh, at least 20 in my lifetime as a guitar player between uh, string companies. GHS is a, is a major uh, pusher of, of what I do. Uh, if you go to the GHS uh, website, string website, you, under blues players, you'll find me uh, music as well as pictures and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, Morley pedals and on and on. And uh, the latest one that I'm very excited about is RJM effects out in Wisconsin. They're uh, they're really uh, very cool to work with and have some great guitar pedals for guitar players out there. And so, But anyway, that that's kind of like where I got the bug. I, I started learning from, from different guitar players and uh, just, you know, listening to Zeppelin albums probably uh, really uh, pushed me along quite heavily. Rush was another influence and uh, just love that sound, acoustic, light and heavy and uh, being able to do intricate guitar, little guitar things and stuff and uh, basically, love all you know, all the different guitar players. I've been influenced by a lot of different ones, uh, even some of the ones that play today as well. I gotta admit, that's kind of you know a really cool way to hear that you got started. But just so many musicians, you know, you hear all over the years. It was always the same story of well, I heard this artist and I went out and bought a guitar and I you know copied what I heard and I taught myself and I bought this and I did all this. And, you know, your story is is so unique in that, you know, here you were not necessarily, you know, having it right in front of you saying, all right, well, I, I want to. I mean, it just kind of happened that you were exposed to so many guitarists at such a young age and they're willing to, to teach you. I mean, that had to be just an amazing experience at the time to have these musicians come in and say, you know, listen, hey, kid, you want to learning how to do what I do. Right. Yep, it's, it was it was quite cool to, to have that happen. And uh, just, uh, you know, um, I continued that later on as a musician. Uh, a, a few years ago, I wanted to advance my playing even more. I try to find every little lick, every little, you know, guitar player that I do run into. I try to find out what they do, how they get their sound, and what they do. And, and if, um, you know, if I can take a lesson here and there, I still do that. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was extremely fortunate to uh, to answer an ad uh, in uh, actually in, in, in a Pennsylvania paper. And uh, when I showed up at the guy's door, uh, it turned out to be Jimmy Brown, the senior music editor of Guitar World magazine, that uh, that uh, ended up teaching me. I, I ended up taking lessons from him by three years, and, and to the point of jamming every time we played. And uh, he taught me a lot more of the technical stuff, like the I'm not per se a Berkeley kind of player, but you know, hanging out with him and learning uh, all of his techniques and stuff, um, it really 
influenced me and even influenced me when I made that Seven Thunders album with his uh, help as far as uh, influence, as far as styles and stuff. And uh, so I've been fortunate to have some great guitar teachers over the years, and including Jimmy Brown, uh, who's been at Guitar World for about over 20 years now. And uh, that's been a, a real, a real plus. So I've, I've, I've really you know, had an interesting story on even how, uh, you know, some of the people I've learned from as well as some of the people I've met. Yeah, I mean, it's also just goes to show you, too, how uh, how small a world the world of rock and metal can be. Everyone just assumes that everyone's out right. there and no one reaches out to each other. And, yeah, it just goes to show you, sometimes a random email or a random ad answer puts you in touch with someone you might have never thought you would have been working with. For sure. Absolutely. So, uh, at what, so... I want to ask you a little bit uh, with Empire. Uh, you, know, you know, that band was around... Were you guys around in, what, the, the 80s or in the, the big heyday of rock and metal in the 80s? Was that around the time you guys were, were doing your thing? Yeah, as far as... Uh, yeah, it was quite a, a, a big uh, time in you know, my life and uh, really what in my case for uh, getting endorsements and uh, working with some of these musicians. I uh, I got to meet the editor of Kerrang! Magazine. Uh, he was interviewing, uh, at the time, Jack Starr from Virgin Steel at the time, and uh, I got to meet him and uh, hook up also with Burn Magazine in Japan and uh, some some foreign magazines and stuff that I probably wouldn't have had that connection had I not known some of these people at the time. And uh, it was quite interesting to meet these people. Uh, you know, they they were to interview, interview those people, but I actually got to, you know, get my feet wet with that, and then they would take our album back to, to, to England and review it and write a review. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, like I said, to this day, the foundation is still a cult following as far as uh, that album is concerned. It, it's not per se a metal album, but it, it had, you know, very visually metal, and uh, and uh, some of the tracks were kind of heavy. And uh, But, you know, we also got to open to Zebra quite a bit, and... Uh, uh, some people out there know that band on Atlantic, and uh, we get to do things like that, and uh, meet a lot of great people, a lot of great producers, and uh, you know, uh, in recent times, I'm I'm really excited because I I used to, I was doing guitar clinics for Guitar Connection or Guitar Con uh, a few years back, and uh, doing Boston and uh, the Meadowlands and stuff like that, and uh, I also got to meet uh, I made uh, friends with Rusty Paul, Les Paul's son. And uh, also Gene Paul, his other son, who's a producer, who he's uh, produced uh, even the Stones, or actually uh, mixed the Mass of the Stones, I believe, and uh, Zeppelin and stuff. But anyway, I got to meet Rusty and, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, got to go on the Gibson tour bus and hang out and, uh, you know, uh, made a connection with that and uh, in Les Paul. And I, I do play a Les Paul, so that's kind of cool as well as a Strat, but um, that was quite a recent, uh, pre- recent connection. Well, that's a cool connection. I mean, everyone, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, everyone wants to make that connection. So, I mean, when you think of the world of rock and metal, I mean, there's no other name that jumps out bigger from a, a musician standpoint when you talk about guitars. And, you know, it's always Les Paul. That's always the name people talk about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I've called Rusty sometimes, and he's uh, he's in the, he's, he's in New Jersey, and and uh, he's had Jimmy Page over at the house when I'm I'm calling. <laughs> it's quite bizarre. It's quite bizarre. I mean, he's he knows you know through his father, he's met everybody, Pete Townsend, uh, uh, Metallica, and on and on and on. Yeah, so it just goes again. It goes to show you how small of a world it really is when it comes to to rock and metal. And so I mean, that just Speak volumes it seems like, like it, it seems like a small world for the people who are actually involved in doing it, if, if you know what I mean. The people who are actually devoting their life to music, it's a small world. Oh, yeah, it is. It, it's very true. I mean, there are you know, those out there that are trying to, to make their name for themselves, and they're you know, busting their ass and doing their band or their solo project, and... You know, some of them find the right connections, some of them don't, and there are individuals like yourself and myself who are 
you know, working on almost a regular everyday basis and tracking down those those right connections and making sure the right people are reached out to 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 find out what's going on and to help get the word out about whatever it is everyone's doing music wise. Right. So uh, it, it really is. it really is. It's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting business when you get down to it, and there's so much involved in it. It's not just uh, plugging in your guitar and playing. There's so much more involved to people who who uh, become a success at it as well. Uh, it's it's got to be you know in your heart in your system. It's 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 got to be something you love to do. Basically, that's the bottom line. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times it's a labor of of love and not, you know, a money thing. Everyone, it's a common misconception of really any aspect of the entertainment industry, but more importantly, the music industry, everyone assumes that, you know, once you're a musician and you've made it and you've got albums out, everyone just assumes, well, you've got money rolling in left and right because you're touring or you're doing albums when, you know, it's not the case. Some... Sometimes, you know, it is that label of love where you're doing it just to keep doing it because you love what you're doing and there are people that love what you're doing and that's what the music industry is really all about. Right. I think it's I think it's really cool that, you know, if you do become a success of what you do, at it, that you uh, don't forget that. You know, I think some artists get to a point where they make their first album or whatever you want to, you know, most of the time, your first album is, is like your tenth album that, that people can latch on to, but uh, um, they forget where they came from, and and that's not cool. And I think that you need to remember where you come from and what what the, what it, what it was a struggle because I don't know a musician who has made it really has got it easy to get to that spot. It's always been a climb of of continuous albums or continuous tours or shows or even if you're a successful club band bar band, uh, it's, 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 it's a lot of work. And my hat's off to a lot of musicians who keep at it and keep doing at it. I mean, that's that's really, really cool thing, you know. Like, you got to love it. That's the bottom line because, you know, there are good gigs, bad gigs. Uh, you just you just got to love what you do and just, just keep going on. And hopefully people will love that, What you, you know, what you have to offer, what music you give out there. Yeah, exactly. You just love what you can keep doing. And as you say, as long as you're the one that loves what you're doing and at the end of the day, if it's a bad gig, so be it. You move on to the next gig and make that one even better than the one the night before. And that's how I know a lot of bands get through even. Yeah, even the bigger bands. People think that the, the big name bands, they just roll in and throw the show together and then they roll out and say, all right, that was good, and move on. There's always, you know, there's always going to be a show that'll bother somebody for whatever reason, a small technical glitch, or maybe not the audience reaction you were anticipating, or maybe a last-minute weather situation resulted in a smaller audience than maybe the band anticipated. You know, anything can happen, and that's why... It's always a labor of love first, and the money, you know, I've always heard from many and said to many, you know, that I know locally that they're trying to make it big, that, look, you got to love it first, and then if the money comes, then so be it, you enjoy it, but don't always make that the priority. Absolutely, it's a, it's definitely a labor of love, and uh, uh, it's really, uh, you got to love it, and... Uh, I think it's a great it's a great thing if you just can keep at it and, and keep uh, keep uh, aspire, aspiring to the next level and, and just keep doing it. Um, I think it is a great thing. So now I want to ask because we talked a little bit uh, about Empire and you obviously have a love of the music. You know when when things really didn't break for Empire as you know many bands unfortunately many bands from. You know, back in the, the big time days of rock and metal in the 70s and 80s, you know, wh- at what point did you say, you know what, I'm not just going to be another one of those band, you know, one of, you know, member of one of those bands that came and went with the, the big heyday of rock and metal. I'm going to keep going and keep doing my thing and keep making stuff as a solo artist. What made you 
kind of decided to go that route? Was that just the pure love of it, or was there some other, you know, things kind of itching at you to get out there and keep doing it? Yeah, it, it's just, uh, well, you know what, I've been through many different ups and downs with music, you know, and finding the right personnel is, is, is a whole, I could write a whole book about that, you know. Uh, finding the right musicians is, is not an easy, and, and other musicians that see the same, uh, have the same goal as you do, that's not always easy to find, you know. Um, it's very difficult to, then the magic happens. When you find the right musicians, it, it, it it's really makes it all worth all the struggle and sweat. It makes it worthwhile. And uh, when you find uh, musicians that that are on the same level as you, and a lot of times, it, you know, it's not just playing the, the guitar or bass or the drums or singing. It's it's also the promotion that you help and you bring to the band and everything else that you bring to the band to make it what it is a band. And uh, there's a lot of things involved, ideas and. Uh, you know, sound uh, things, and the main, main thing is, though, you, you still also want to make it fun as well. There's so many people who just get so into it that they lose that, and the public knows that. When you play in a band and you play live out in front of the public, they they know, it comes across. If you love what you do, and uh, you really feel it, you really feel what you're doing, and you're really presenting something live for the audience to see and hear, uh, they'll know it, and then your audience will grow. I, I really do believe that, you know. But if you're just going through the motions, it's just not going not gonna to be very enjoyable for somebody to come see you play. But uh, uh, for me, it's just something inside of me, in, in bread, that I just uh, I love to do. Um, I'm always going on to the next level. It's always a new thing next week that I haven't obtained from, you know, something new that I've obtained this week that I didn't do last week, uh, whether it be a, a really cool song that I finally got where I wanted to go or uh, another connection uh or even doing a radio show like this, uh, it's just a, another level for me. And I really appreciate you having me here as well. well I'm glad to have you on. You're part of what I do here inside the asylum and part of what uh, my home station, uh, both like radio and even the syndicates are carrying me. Uh, you know, it's what we're all about. The, the music industry nowadays, while technology has gotten its bashing moments from the industry and and, you know, we all know it's hurt the music industry over the years. It's also allowed the music industry a bigger voice with social media and internet radio and podcasting and, and other things like that. Because it allows artists like yourselves and like so many local and indie bands or even bands on the major labels. It's just the label doesn't have the time or money to promote because they have to put it into their cash cow band shall we say and it allows people to actually get their voices heard as opposed to you know maybe 10 or 15 years ago when basically all you had was satellite radio and fm radio and if you didn't have a label you really weren't getting heard right yes the internet has been awesome uh especially a guy like me i am definitely a internet uh, type uh, person that's that's helped his career through the internet. You know, you can Google me anywhere. Uh, uh, every you know, uh, hundreds of videos, uh, uh, articles, uh, stories, uh, you name it. It's it's on the internet, and uh, that's really uh, definitely been a big help. And uh, you try to everything that you do because the internet picks up everything. Just about is you try to give it your best, your, your all, whether it be a video, whether it be an article whether it be an uh, interview, whatever. Um, I think the Internet's made a big difference, and uh, local bands down the street now can release a song that they did in their garage, and iTunes picks it up, and uh, in Australia you can hear it. The big difference now, um, you know, record companies, I think, uh, are totally, you know, pretty pretty non-existent for, especially if you're a metal band or a rock band, it's really difficult to get, uh, per se, Sony, or, you know, they're too, you know, they're too interested in the... In the, in the the Hall of Fame type bands that are already there uh, to get them interested in you. Uh, the industry doesn't want demos anymore. That's another thing. You pretty much. That's why. I, uh, that's why I've, I've taken a while since Seven Thunders to release another product because the industry does not like demos. It, it seems like, as far as record companies, they don't want to hear a demo. They want to hear a finished product, and that costs money. That's very expensive to make a real quality uh, song because you're now the record company. 
you know, and in, in order to attain that kind of attention, you need to put, you know, together a top quality uh, recording. And uh, demos don't do it anymore. You know, they might be great to for your fans and stuff like that. But if you are looking for a record label, uh, I, a, a high quality demo will, will surely give you a really better shot at it. Um, and they're not, you know, at this point, they're really not called demos anymore because you've spent tons of money and, you know, corrected every little thing that could possibly be corrected before you put the thing out. Um, and uh, so it's kind of changed a lot the industry as far as that concerned. You really don't need a record company. You need a booking agent. You need a merchandising. You need a, uh, you know, uh, management possibly. That's that's about it to go on tour. You you have all of those things in place. Uh, a good fa- local fan base. That's a that's a, a good way to start. And um, you know, it's, it's a lot different than it was back, you know, twenty years ago. That's for sure. And uh, you know. Uh, plus, by doing all those things inside the band, you don't owe a major record company thousands of dollars. You know, it's all inside the band. Uh, everybody, you know, I don't know, I think uh, having a, a major record company is, is not what it used to be because you owe back so much to that label before you start to make any money, as well as doing it independently. It's pretty cool, you know? Yeah, and not, but, only that, uh, not only that, but with the, the record labels, I mean, you hear the horror stories nowadays, of so many yeah. of so many bands that they don't even own their own material. The label owns it, and a lot of these bands have to wait for the label to either go bankrupt for them to buy their own music back, or they've got to wait for someone at the label. And I hate to put it put it this way, but they got to wait for someone at the label to drop dead, so they can get the rights back because it belongs to a certain executive at the label, and as long as that person's living, they own it, you know, and it it was kind of a sad state for so many bands that they had all this music out there that they really didn't own and they really weren't seeing money from. Right, right. There's a lot of, I would would say to say there's a lot of probably bands that uh, to this day, uh, you know, lost a lot of money to to record labels, and, uh, you know, um, you know, it's crazy if you sell a million copies on your first album. If your second one uh, doesn't do as well, then the record company uh, looks down upon that. You know, uh, I'm pretty positive that Guns N' Roses' first album, uh, they didn't make any money much on it at all. I don't know if you know the story behind it. Uh, they, uh, you know, I think the record company made most of the money on that first album. Yeah, well, that's how a lot of it went back in the day. A lot of the, the, the labels made all the money. I mean, have been... Look at, look at KISS, for example. Everyone assumed that KISS it, you know, was a multi-million dollar band from day one. But the history of KISS is that the band was flat broke up until they released the live, the double live EP, Alive. And that's when their money first started rolling in. And that's when the label was finally able to say, all right, we, you know, the money we owe you for the first three albums, here it is, because now the albums are selling. And that's when it really yeah. took off. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Uh, my hat's off to a band like Twisted Sister, because I, I grew up in that area uh, and, and, and saw them many times play and ran across them many times. And uh, they... Uh, they did everything themselves and, uh, you know, did all their promotion and uh, made all the hubbub in the early days, uh, you know, and I'm really, really happy that they were able to become a success eventually because I remember them struggling for years in the Long Island circuit and, uh, you know, to uh, obtain the level that they finally did. In fact, today they're probably bigger than ever, I, I, from what I understand. Yeah, the, uh, funny, the, the, the yeah, funny thing oh, about Twisted Sister is that yeah, they, they didn't do stuff for a lot of years, and then they reunited after uh, 9-11 to play Eddie Trunk's New York Steel show, and then that put them back on the map. It was one of those, they were gone for so many years, the fan base just grew and grew, and the best part of it is even to this day, they own and do all their own booking, they own the music, they do all their own stuff, I mean, they even said earlier this year because there were shows being announced that they were on when they really weren't on them that they actually 
how to publicly say on their Facebook website and Twitter that if we don't personally announce it, we're not on the lineup. And it just goes to show you that, you know, what it pays to maybe take that model of do it yourself and keep outside fingers out of the ointment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it, it, it's amazing. It's, uh, what, basically it all goes back to, to, to your love of, of music, your love of, of wanting to be in a band that, that goes somewhere, you know? It's amazing how much you can accomplish when you really totally put your all into it. It's so it's hard to be thankful. Yep. It, it, it is pretty amazing, and if you look at some of these bands, uh, you know, it's it's just everybody, you know, had success from, from different things, you know, whether you band or uh, a band from, from America. Um, I, I always point to Twisted because I know where they come from. I know the little bars they play. I've seen them, I, and they, uh, you know, Dee Snyder pushed all the way through, you know. He just, uh, just a, 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 a interesting and uh, probably won't get much respect from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but that's really the, the kind of bands that were in the, the trenches, you know? Yeah, I mean, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that's a whole... You know what? If they really <laughs> if they really did, were able to do it right, you know, it would be one thing, and I could go off on a whole, a whole hour alone on that subject. It's just... Uh, I'm I'm in agreement with so many people, with Eddie Trunk and so many others, and I've often said they should just rename it, you know, like the American Music Hall of Fame or, you know, America's Hall of Fame of Music. That way you can keep the out-of-country artists um, involved to call it the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and have KISS be ignored up until this year and to still have... You, uh, you know, Deep Purple not be in there and to have Madonna and Abba go in before some other artists went in. And it's, just, uh, it's just crazy. For sure, yep, absolutely, absolutely. It's a whole other, uh, you could do a whole show. For sure. Exactly, exactly. I do it every year. Every year they announce who it is going in every year I go on my my little tirade about it and look the good thing is though it is starting to turn around and the, whether they didn't want Kiss in or not they didn't have a choice they had to put Kiss in it had its controversy it, it still will it still always will because of how Kiss went in but at least they're starting to get woken up a little bit there right. And, uh, you know, Rob, before I let you go, because I know you've got stuff to do, I know you mentioned it's been a while since you did Seven Thunders. I was wondering if you've written any material yet for the follow-up to Seven Thunders, or if you're maybe on the verge of maybe getting ready to put uh, an album together. Where are you at in regards to following up? Okay, well, we added a... I would call him a virtuoso drummer, a very good rock drummer, Rick Rocket. Uh, that's his stage name. Um, John Heaton Jones is the new vocalist, and he's, uh, he's, uh, I guess he's got an English background like myself. And, uh, um, I think that, uh, we should have a recording to hopefully premiere, maybe on your show, uh, in the next, uh, this summer for sure. We're working on it right now. Um, and, uh, we should have a, uh, hopefully a four song EP to, uh, to let you let everyone check out it's uh it's uh you know a little bit uh a little heavy at times a little lighter at times but uh kind of kind of interesting and uh, a lot of hooks a lot of guitar things going on and uh bigger big vocals and uh i think uh i think everybody out there is going to like it it's a it's a another extension of what i do and uh, uh i think uh this might be uh one of the better bands that i've been able to put together so i think this summer yeah, very you, know, cool. you should be able to. You should be able to get an EP. Um, definitely before the August twenty third uh, of some kind. August twenty third gig down in Staten Island at the Northeast Music Fest. Um, we plan on doing some other festivals. We got one this Saturday. 
in Maine. Uh, the uh, Gardner River Fest uh, is coming up on Saturday. And we have some other ones, uh, hopefully down in Boston, more in New York. And uh, uh, there's also a possibility that we might go to New Jersey uh, to record as well. Um, that We've been talking about that. And uh, uh, there's a really unbelievable studio down there, and I've, I've met the engineer down there and the producer down there that, that really wants to help us you know, achieve the goal that we're looking for. And uh, that might be the place to do it. It's, it's an old uh, uh, reel-to-reel 24-track studio. Uh, I think the latest, uh, the last thing they recorded there was the Les Paul Tribute album. Uh, and I know people like Clapton have been in there and uh, Leslie West and other people. So it's a real top-notch studio. So that's uh, another thing. We don't know if we're going to get down there before August, but uh, that's that's on the, the, the drawing board there. And we've got all kinds of things we're working on, a new logo, uh, all kinds of... Uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, our, our visual show, what that's going to look like. and uh, We're just trying to put together a thing as, as professional as possible, and uh, I'll definitely uh, keep all the listeners uh, updated on a, on a new uh, EP when that comes out. I think, uh, I think it'll be very cool. Very cool. We've got to look forward to from Rob Carlton and his band coming up this summer. I told you guys it was going to be a good year for new music, and he had Rob Carlton to that list. Well, before you go, I let you go, where can everyone find you online? Okay, one of the fastest places is www.sonicbids.com slash Rob Carlton. Um, you can find out a lot of updated band stuff. Um, you can uh, catch us on Spotify, uh, Pandora. Uh, my singer uh, has some things out under a uh, thing called Boudica. You can check out his voice uh, for now. Um, and um, the RCB thing should be, uh, uh, you know, up pretty soon uh, somewhere. Uh, you can probably find it on CD Baby eventually. Or you can go to CD Baby and buy any of my four uh, solo albums, check them out. Or you can, you know, go to YouTube and put in the Rob Carlton fan and see a lot of videos. And uh, uh, Google, just Google my name. It's uh, R-O-B, uh, first name Rob, of course, and then Carlton, C-A-R-L-T-O-N, and band. Or just Seven Thunders, Rob Carlton. They can find a lot about that album. And uh, that's pretty easy. Uh, you can, you know, I'm pretty internet accessible. Very, very easy to find out a lot about me. Very cool, man. Very cool. I want to thank you for taking the time out to join me here inside the asylum tonight. And I got Seven Thunders in front of me, so I thought I would ask you what track from Seven Thunders we should play. Oh, uh, the first track. The first track would be awesome. This, this first track would be great. All right, gang. Here it is the title track. The from Rob Carlton's 2011 album. This is Seven Thunders. Don't go anywhere. More to come inside the asylum. <laughs> 